also this week I want to introduce a bit more or uh, talk a bit more about this quality of silence or this quality of the nature of your own consciousness and in Buddhism the word consciousness is used slightly differently to the way that we would use it in English but these are reflections so remember last week I was talking about Dhamma Vijaya investigation of Dharma and what that means is other than concentrating on your meditation object we should also be investigating the things that are entangling the mind so the Buddha had this very nice sutta someone asked him who can disentangle this this great tangle and he said that there are ways to disentangle yourself from this tangle and the tangle is we're tangled up in things of the world we're tangled up in the thoughts, ideas, the dreams the worries, the memories the fears, the physical sensations and all the rest of it these are things that keep pulling the mind outside of itself whereas to bring the mind back inside of itself this we need to focus on with silence and this silence is actually always there so we have these two practices one is the practice of where we're taking the mind and one is a backwards practice or a backing away from the things that entangle the mind so you may notice that with the meditation the the difficulties that come up with the meditation are always ones of things that are pulling your attention so your attention can be pulled away from yourself into thoughts of the past, the present and the future worries, desires, wants, all the rest of it it can also be pulled into states states like sleepiness uh, states like too much energy or effervescence in the mind so this is always our attention being caught up with the content and in Buddhism we, dis we differentiate between three things the jitta or the knowing the content which is called the aramana or the object but the content of the mind and thirdly the process so our path of meditation is one of moving the attention and starting to see the process rather than the content but looking at the suffering in things will tend to disentangle you from the things of the world so that your attention can come back and be with yourself when your attention comes back and is with yourself and don't get confused with self and no self here all I mean is the experience when I say self I'm talking about not talking about an Atman some great philosophical concept of a super being or, or whatever I'm talking about the experience you have an experience a living humming buzzing thriving experience of being alive and that right there is real that's that's your self it's an impermanent self it's a changing self so we don't need to get confused with non-self teaching in Buddhism as we can bring the attention into that silence and into that presence there are two key experiences one is profound dullness and emptiness and I know quite a lot of people who've experienced this and then backed away from meditation because it seems like this big black hole that sucks you in of just sheer dull emptiness and quite a few good yogis I know that e even in our group in Bangkok have really approached that state and then really backed off and what's happening there is the mind is stopping still but you're still caught up in the content of the mind and the content of the mind is completely empty because the mind has stopped still 
So it's like nothing, completely nothing. It doesn't seem very attractive. But a slight change of viewpoint, slight change of standpoint to what sees the emptiness, that is complete fullness and very bright and very alert and very still. So when you're viewing the content, it can seem quite scary, but when you're viewing the observer or the knowing, it's really the most beautiful thing. Taken to the extremes, these are the jhana meditations. And the first jhana meditation is the experience of infinite space. And if that doesn't scare you a bit, infinite space. Because it's infinite, right? It's just like, you need limits to things in order to get hold of it in your mind. But the thing that sees the infinite space is the other, is the subject, which is infinite consciousness. And infinite consciousness is a very beautiful thing. So, the, the, this twin aspect, whether you're viewing the uh, content or the observer, content being aramana, which you might know, the Thai people here will know the word arom. And arom means mood, but nearly always means bad mood. But actually the word arom means any kind of mood. It comes from the word aramana in the Pali, and aramana means the object that consciousness is focused on. And for a long time, psychologists and scientists and philosophers have been trying to find consciousness independent of the object you are conscious of. So this is William James. He's one of the grandfathers of psychology even really before Freud. And he noted that he can't find any kind of consciousness independent of an object of consciousness. The fact that William James couldn't find it doesn't mean that it isn't there. Right. And so you can see that in his masterpiece, but boy, it's a, it's a very difficult book to read. His, his English language skills are not good. He's American, but he's, <laughs> he's, it, it's called The Varieties of Religious Experience, is the name of the book, and it's one of the very, really classic texts. So the consciousness, the thing that views it, is called jitta, or mind, and jitta is, has various different meanings in Buddhism, but in this sense, jitta is what knows, and the aramana is what's known. So, to really get to practice the meditation, we need to switch our attention from what's known into what knows. That's the first step. So, the, this thing that we know and is knowing is slap bang in the present moment. And it is the experience. And there's always this philosophical argument in the world. Is the world I idealist who feel that the whole world is mind and mind only because you can't know anything other than mind. Any body or form that there is, you only know it because it's coming to your mind. And on the other end of the philosophical scale, you have the materialists who say, well, mind is just some kind of function, but everything depends upon physical matter. So you have this duality. Are things mind only or form only? However, in the original text, the Buddha neatly sidesteps this whole question, whether everything is mind or everything is form. He also sidesteps the question of whether things are body or mind, which is a slightly different question. In Theravada Buddhism, in the original text, all these questions are neatly sidestepped. And the Buddha said that, he didn't say that there is no body and mind, he didn't say there is no idealist philosophy and materialist philosophy. What he said was, there is experience. And that's why I call this talk the experientialist. And the experience that comes up, any experience that comes up, must have various mental qualities and physical qualities. 
if you can hear the sound of the air conditioning right now, you have a physical quality of the impingement of the sound waves upon your eardrum. It's the physical side. You also have the side of whether you like it or you dislike it. Or you may be neutral. But usually when you pull something into consciousness, it's very difficult to be neutral. You will automatically judge whether it's attracting you or pushing you away, whether you want to keep it going or whether you want to stop it. There is also an intentionality. It's a direction that you are pointing the mind. So if you're hearing the air conditioner, intentionality is pointing you at that sound. So you have an intentionality, which is a pushing you there. You have the liking and the disliking. You have the perception, because you know what that sound is, you know where it's come from. And you have mind states. So your mind is either interested or disinterested, bright or dull, expanded, contracted. Your mind is pre-coffee or post-coffee. So these four things, these four things, the mind states, the perception or the memory, the liking and the disliking and the intentionality, these are called the mental side. And the physical form is the form side. And you put these together and you get a word called Nama Rupa, which is a common word, not only in Buddhism, but also in all Indian traditions. <coughs> So what this means is that you can't have any kind of mental experience without a physical basis. And you can't have any kind of physical experience without the mental qualities accompanying it. So what are you left with? You're left with an experience. And the experience is what is real. And that experience is necessarily in the present moment. It can't be anywhere else. There can't be any question of you keeping your attention in the, in the present moment anymore if you're seeing it as an experientialist. Why don't we see our, the world this way? Well, we are caught up in our stories and most people see a story of what's happening rather than what's really happening. That's why I say that right now you think you are here listening to me and I say you're not. I don't think you're here do you know that stupid joke? Shall I tell you the stupid joke? <laughs> this joke's really stupid. I can prove you're not here. I can prove you're not here. Are you in Los Angeles? No. no. Are you in Paris? No. If you're not in Los Angeles and you're not in Paris, you must be somewhere else. And if you're somewhere else, you're not here. <laughs> I warned you, I said to you, it's a stupid joke. So you actually aren't here. You really are not here. Why? You're telling yourself a story that you're here, but your actual experience is not like that. Your actual experience is your glasses are slipping off your face. You feel it. You move your hand, you adjust it. It feels better. You move your hand back. Something is in your teeth and you, okay, you do that. Your knee aches and you just twist a little bit. And then you hear the sound of the air conditioner and then you experience that. And then somebody has just moved across the room and you're like, who is it? That's your actual experience. You're not sitting here listening to me. You're leaping around through all of these little experiences. Each one of them comes up and that's real and true in, the, in that moment. Then your mind is flipped onto something else. But you tell yourself the story that you sat here and listened to me the whole time. <laughs> it's interesting how we do this because there is an experiment on split brain patients and these are people with epilepsy, severe epilepsy, and one of the treatments is to cut the brain in half, straight down the middle, the corpus callosum, and you cut the brain here. And the weird thing is that you do this with people and they manage to function perfectly well. It does actually stop epilepsy. You have to be a very extreme form of epilepsy to have this operation. And people live and function perfectly normally, perfectly well, having done this. 
But the experimenters knew that somehow, somewhere, something must be wrong because you just cut their brain in half. And this is where this whole left brain, right brain thing came from. It's not really quite true. But so basically, your right brain can recognize objects and what they do. Your left brain can name them. So what they would do is show you a spoon through your left eye and that comes through to your right brain. And you say to the person, what's that object? This is split brain people. What is that object? They say, I don't know. And you say, what would you use that object for? I'd eat my soup. And if you go the other way and you close off this eye and very often the ear, there's a trick to the ear. And you say, show them a spoon. You say, what do you use this for? No idea. What's this object called? It's a spoon. And this is where this whole idea of left brain, right brain came from. People whose brains have been chopped in half. It actually doesn't apply to ordinary people because the information crosses. So one of the interesting things was if you cover this eye and you say, what is this uh, object used for? I have no idea. And you say, what is its name? And they say, a spoon. Oh. I used it for eating. And you know what happened? This brain can say it's a spoon. This comes out of your mouth, comes in through your, other, through your ear, across to this side of the brain, and this side of the brain says it's for eating. So if they close off the ear, then you don't get that secondary stage. So they're working on patients who have had this kind of operation. And they closed off the eyes and the ears and presented things to each side of the brain. So to one side of the brain, they presented a chicken. And the other side, they presented uh, an ice scenery, snowy scenery. And they, they don't make me work out which side of the brain they're working on. They were working on one side of the brain and they said to the person, what would you do with this object? And he said, well, I would cook it up and I would eat it with cock of van, red wine and onions. And then they said, what kind of tool in your garage do you associate with this object? And the guy said, a shovel. And they said, why do you associate this object with a shovel? Now you know, right? Because he's seen the snow and he he associates the snow with shoveling his driveway. But that side of his brain hasn't seen the snow yet. Consciously, unconsciously, obviously it has seen the snow because it picks up a shovel. Now the interesting part, they say to him, why do you pick a shovel? And he said, well, chickens obviously leave chicken shit everywhere and I have to shovel it up. So what's happening is he's inventing a story to explain his experience. And this is what people do all the time. Your story to explain this experience is that you are sitting here listening to me, rather than you were shuffling, your knee ached, your glasses moved, you looked at your watch, you thought of the time, you wondered what's for lunch, you readjusted your clothes, then you listened to me again for a few seconds and then you moved somewhere else. That's what's actually happening for people. But you tell yourself a story, a narrative. And this narrative is something that tries to coalesce this effervescent bubbles of experience and try to make it into some kind of cohesive whole that you can relate to. The same thing happened, I think it was Freud. And he was first got interested in psychology when he went to see a hypnotist stage hypnotist and they had a bunch of people lined up on the stage and the hypnotist said to this one woman that when the clock strikes one you will go and close the window but no need to remember this go and sit down she sits down they carry on and do the rest of the show with all the other people and then the clock struck one and the woman gets up and goes and closes the window then the person on the stage says, why did you just close the window? She said, well, it was a bit drafty. 
Now we know that's not the reason she closed the window. She'd been programmed to do this. But the point is that she didn't know that, so she invented a narrative to explain her experience. And this is how Freud came up with the idea of the unconscious. He's saying your unconscious has various experiences and you'll do something for this or that reason, but if I ask you what the reason is, you won't know. You will invent some story to tell me, but the real mechanisms that drive your experience and your behavior are in your unconscious. That's where the whole idea of the unconscious, subconscious and conscious mind came from. So these are stories that we tell ourselves because we only need to actually use basic information. Usually when I do this talk, I have my bag, I forgot. And usually I have my green bag or my brown bag. And I make everyone close their eyes and then I'll hide my bag and then I'll ask you what color my bag was. And only about 10% of people will actually know what color my bag was, even though it was right there the entire time. Two years ago, I was talking about this and I had a box of chocolates on here. I asked everyone to close their eyes and say, what is on my table? And people say, there was notes on your table, there's a microphone, there's a bell, there's your clock. Nobody saw the chocolates. You think, you think, right? You'd notice the chocolates. You wouldn't notice anything else, really, would you? <laughs> Nobody noticed the box of chocolates. It was Ferro Rocher. I mean, they're quite visual. Nobody noticed them. It's a funny experiment that they do. I love psychology. It's great. It's mischievous. So in the psychology, people were coming to do a test with the psychologists. And when they come in, they get the form and they have to register. So they come in and they, there's a nice looking man behind the counter. And they said, they've come to register for this experiment. Oh, just a second. And he dips down behind the counter and he gets the form. But it's a different man who stands up. And unbeknown to the people, they're already in the experiment. And they want to know, do you notice that it's a different man who stood up? And nearly everybody doesn't notice. Now you're all thinking, oh, I would notice. <laughs> no. And if you did notice, you would notice by accident. That is, you might notice the color of the man's shirt is blue. You might say, oh, that's a nice color of blue, or I've seen this color of blue. And then the next man stands up and he has a black shirt on. Then you might notice. But it's purely accidental if you happen to notice something. Because we work by simple story narratives. You come in, there's a man there, he went down, he came up and he gave you a form. That's the story that you tell yourself. And that's enough. Some, it's quite funny. Some people are like, I knew it. I knew there was something wrong with him when I came in. <laughs> But they can't pinpoint what it was that had gone wrong. Obviously, the man has to be fairly similar. If it's like a fat, bald man who goes down and a tall, skinny man who stands up, you're going to notice right away. So it needs to fit into something like the same kind of story. I get this a lot because people say to me, when they see me around town or in a taxi or something, people say to me, oh, I know you, I know you, I've, read, I've seen you on TV. I'm like, no, that's Ajahn Jayasara. <laughs> oh, I've read one of your books. No, that's Ajahn Jayasara's book. <laughs> because we're both good-looking English monks, aren't we? So we fit the same narrative picture. <laughs> so... We live our life, people live their lives by stories. We have this narrative that tries to stitch together this effervescent experience that we have of actually the consciousness that jumps and leaps around from one thing to another thing to another thing. And this is why your meditation seems to be getting worse because you're starting to get past the narratives and see what's actually happening in the mind. This is what the Buddha called the monkey mind. And people think the monkey mind means your mind is jumping around like a monkey because you can't keep still 
and because you're hyperactive. That wasn't the meaning. He said, monks, easy it would be if I told you about the impermanence of the body. Because the body lives for 20 years, 40 years, 60 years, 100 years or more. And you can see it decline, you can see it cease. It gets older, the teeth turn yellow, the back becomes crooked as a roof rafter. I love this symbolism. But hard it is to see that this mind is impermanent. Because by day, by night, it leaps up as one thing, and before it's ceased, it's grabbed onto another thing, second by second by second. Just like a monkey swinging through the forest, grabs hold of one bough or one branch, lets go of that branch to grab another branch. So the mind goes swinging through your experience. He said, this is hard to see as impermanent. Very interesting, right? that the, the faster, the most obviously impermanent thing is the one that we feel is permanent, the one that we feel is me, I, myself doing things. Well, your experience is not like that. Your experience is one of continually jumping around, moving around. And this is actually quite handy because it means that nothing really stays in the mind for too long. Even bad things, even good things. So I have my story of uh, every school has little Johnny who causes trouble. Our little Johnny in my school was not such a troublemaker. His name was Johnny Ryman. And his, he had a big lawn out the back of his house and it was being dug up by moles. And his parents laid out some traps to catch the mole. And they caught the mole on a Thursday night. And I rem even though I was only seven years old at this time, I can still tell you with absolute certainty it was a Thursday night that his parents caught the mole. Because on Friday morning, little Johnny Ryman brought the mole in to school to terrify all the other seven-year-old girls in the class. And all the boys, of course, were fascinated. And he brought this in and showed us around. And as the evening came on Friday, 3.45, little Johnny Ryman went home, but he left the mole in his desk, the dead mole in his desk. And when we came back on the Monday, when we opened the door, the stink that came out of that classroom was absolutely discombobulating. It made you disorientated, like you had to hold on to something to stand up straight. The stink was so vicious. Now, even the teacher wouldn't go into the room. We were just all reeled back from this awful smell. So awful, I'm wondering actually if there was like a midterm break that had gone on. I just remember how bad this smell was. So the headmaster was called and he comes stomping down. He's a pretty tough man, you know. So he marched into the room. We opened up the windows and then he stood by the door and said, right, all of you, in you go. And we're like, no, no, we can't. Yes, you get in. And he marched us into this room all like, <laughs> kind of throwing up. Even the teacher didn't want to go in. But you know what happened? Within 10 minutes, we were all just sitting there doing our class. Why? Because the conscious mind has picked it up as an object. Like, oh, it's awful. And then you're just doing your mathematics and you've forgotten about it. Now what I found interesting about the experience was mid-morning we have our milk break back in the days when schools used to give you bottles of milk when milk was so good for you the government gave it to you for free. Of course now people, people are down on milk. Or has it come back into fashion again now? These things usually come and go. I remember those lukewarm bottles of milk were awful. Oh man. And they should force us to drink it. So when we came back in after the morning milk break, the room stank again. That's what I found interesting. During the class, we'd just completely forgotten about it. But then when we came back into it, into the room again, it really stank again. 
Now that's really interesting. That just shows how the mind, when it picks something up, usually it picks up something that's unusual in its environment, something that's interesting or in the uh, psychological language we call salient. Picks up the salient feature and then, remember what we said, what the Buddha is teaching, there are these four mental sides to the story and then there's the physical side. In this case there's the physical smell, then there's the liking and the disliking, there's the intentionality pointing your mind towards it, there's the perceptions of what it is, what it is from, and there's the mind states that you have while you approach that thing. So what this whole process means, the reason the Buddha is really pointing to this process, is this is where suffering arises. You really can't suffer over something that isn't being pulled up into conscious experience in that second. Think about something that you really, really hate. I don't want to use Donald Trump again, I want to find a different, um, different thing that you really dislike. Not long ago I had an injection and tetanus injection, I didn't like that. I, I go queasy at the sight of needles. And so it hurt my arm. But does my arm hurt the whole time? No, because 90% of the time I'm just doing something else. It's only when I put conscious attention onto something that suffering starts to come up. So this is what in Buddhism is called viewing process or process if you're American. Viewing process. Rather than viewing the content of the mind, you view the process that as soon as something comes into conscious attention, you get catapulted into this step by step by step mechanism. Oh, I like this, I don't like this. If I don't like this, well, what do I want? And because of what I want, I have attachment. Because of attachment, I have a state of mind come up around this thing and then I'm a, what we call bhava, being. I have an active intentionality around this thing. It's a process that comes up because I just put my attention onto it. If I put my attention somewhere else, this process just dissipates and goes away. So, viewing the process was what was important and the Buddha called this the seeing the arising of the world and the cessation of the world. And actually did, I did a talk on this in Singapore and I called it this, the end of the world. And it was a talk for the Singapore youth group and there was hundreds of them came and they thought I was going to talk about prophecies about how the world ends. <laughs> and when I talked about the process of pulling things into conscious experience they were really unhappy and they're like, you were going to tell us about the end of the world. <laughs> So this is the process that we're looking at and this is the last, this is the next part of the meditation that I'm encouraging you to look at. If you've got mindfulness reasonably well trained, you will be able to spot things as they come into your attention and as they catapult in this chain reaction that comes from it. By seeing this process you see the whole world coming up you can also, if you stay with it, see the whole world ceasing as it just starts to filter and out of your consciousness. This gives you enormous confidence that anything that arises will cease. One of the key insights in Buddhism. It's not a psychological insight, it's an insight you have to have by watching it in meditation. So, the form of the teaching goes like this, there is a, you have your eye, you have forms, you have eye consciousness, which means in this very second of experience you're not feeling the feelings in your foot, you're not listening to the air conditioner, you're not looking at the clock, in this very second you are looking at something with the eye. That's I consciousness, because you've got consciousness fixed on that thing. Because of that, feeling will arise. Feeling means liking or disliking. Because of liking or disliking arising, wanting will arise. 
because of wanting arising, attachment will arise. Because of attachment arising, you get uh, memory or perceptions. There are different formats of this teaching, I'm giving you one of them. Uh, perceptions will arise, and because of that perception, there will be liking or disliking arise. Because of that liking or disliking, there will be desiring arise. Because of that desiring, there will be attachment arise. Because of that attachment, you will have perceptions arise. So, I see a camera. I want a new camera. What kind of camera shall I get? I like the Panasonic. Who told me about the Panasonic? That was this guy told me about the Panasonic. And they use that in this place and they do blah, blah, blah. And the mind is off on this endless chain. That's what's called Pat Pancha. Pat Pancha, or scattered and diffuse thinking. And the Buddha said, monks, train yourself to be one who is of precise thinking. And the word precise is Napat Pancha, which means not diffuse thinking. So, that's the story on consciousness. You'll notice that consciousness in Buddhism means conscious attention given to something. It doesn't mean like an underlying field of consciousness into which things come and go. It means the experience of the, ex the exact experience that you have in the present moment. So, you are encouraged to view process. Is all of that clear? So, if consciousness is consciousness of something, what's the word that we would have in English, which means the overarching consciousness of all, like a, we would take consciousness as like a field, that things come in and out of this continuous field. And that's definitely what it's not meaning in, con, in Buddhism. And it's partly a mistranslation. The word actually is wit jnana, and wit means special, and jnana means knowing. So it's special knowing. Within your experience right now, if you listen to the air conditioner, that's a special knowing that's put on the air conditioner. And you're ignoring the colours of the flowers behind me. You're ignoring the feeling of the pressure on your bum as you're sitting on the seat. So within your field of experience, you've picked something out. That's vijnana, consciousness. Is there a word for our idea of an overarching consciousness? Not really, but the closest would be jitta, and jitta being mind, and a ramana being the object of mind. Yeah. I can go into more of this maybe next week, one of my favourite topics, but it goes right into enlightenment, but too much for today. You